morning. Let's all stand together today. There is no shadow that has ever overcome your life. There is no rival that could ever stand against your might. You've always been with us. Every battle you've already won, we've already won. Yes, Lord. Sing out, there's no weapon. And there is no weapon that has ever left a mark on you. There is no army with the power to conquer truth. You've always been with us. Every battle you've already won. You've already won. Yes, we have. Show me one thing he can't do. Show me a mountain he can't move. He's the God of the breakthrough, and anything is possible. Show me one thing that's too hard. Show me waters he can't part. He's the God of the breakthrough, and anything is possible. It's possible. There is a kingdom. That's advancing at the speed of life. And in his kingdom, every dead thing is bound to rise. For oh God, our Redeemer, he is faithful to revive. Oh, he will revive. Let's sing out. Show me one thing. Show me one thing he came to. Show me a mountain he can't do. He's the God of the breakthrough, and anything is possible. Show me, show me one thing that's too hard. Show me waters he can't part. He's the God of the breakthrough, and anything is possible. We declare that today. Show me one thing. Show me one thing he can't do. Show me a mountain he can't do. He's the God of the breakthrough, and anything is possible. Show me, show me one thing that's too hard. Show me waters he can't part. He's the God of the breakthrough, and anything is possible. Oh, it's possible with you, Lord. Anything with you, Lord. Oh, oh, all of my fear I will turn into praise. Shake off despair as I sing out your name. A victory dance, I will dance out in faith. I will crush disappointment and break every chain. Oh, all of my fear I will turn into praise. Shake off despair as I sing out your name. A victory dance, I will dance out in faith. I will crush disappointment and break every chain. The wall of my fear, I will turn into praise. Shake off despair as I sing out your name. A victory dance, I will dance out in faith. I will crush disappointment. One more time, all of my fear. The wall of my fear, I will turn into praise. Shake off despair as I sing out your name. A victory dance, I will dance out in faith. I will crush disappointment. Show me one thing he can do. Show me a mountain he can move. He's a God of the breakthrough and anything is possible. Show me one thing that's too hard. Show me waters you can't part. He's the God of the breakthrough and anything is possible. Show me, show me one thing you can do. Show me a mountain you can't He's 
introduce a new song. We're going to start off with the chorus, but it has a lot of words. I'm going to just put that out there. There are a lot of words, but if you don't sing and you read the screen while you listen to the words being sung, it is, that is when I actually looked at the words and was like, oh my gosh, it's so good. Because really we all want Christ to be magnified, right? In ourselves. And we already know that all of creation is stuck in this space right now where they can't praise God to the fullness of their ability, right? Because of the fall, right? But if they could, the sounds that we would hear would be incredible. Can we all agree on that? So this morning, we want to glorify Jesus. We want Christ to be magnified in this place. We want Christ to be magnified in our lives. Every day, every minute, every hour. Oh God, we need you today. We want to honor you in all that we say and do. So Christ, be magnified. Be magnified in me. Be magnified in the way I talk to my kids. Be magnified in the way I talk to my husband when I feel annoyed. Be magnified in me when I'm doing dishes, Jesus. Be magnified in me when I'm scrolling Facebook or whatever else I do. Be magnified in me when I get up and go to the job that I don't like. I don't have one of those, that's not for me personally. But God, be magnified in me when it's toilet day and that's not fun. Be magnified in me when we have the humdrum of life. Be magnified in me when it's exciting, when we all are joining together, lifting up your name, be magnified. Because you are worthy because you stand alone, because there's none greater than you. So God, may we not hold back from you today. May we sing this song and be able to mean it with our whole hearts, that we want you to be magnified in us when we leave, when we're here together and when we are not together. Be magnified in us. May our lives be a sweet aroma to you every day. We're singing, oh, Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified. From the altar of my life, Christ be magnified in Let's sing that again, oh Christ, oh Christ be magnified, let his praise arise, Christ be magnified in me, oh Christ be magnified. The altar of my life, Christ be magnified in me. Oh, I honor you, I glorify you. Oh, and we're creation suddenly articulate. Would burst from sea. 
Bye. 
That's our prayer today, that you would be magnified in us. Jesus, be magnified in us. As the ushers come this morning to prepare to serve communion, the second part of that bridge is really just the reminder of what we're about to do. This life is not the sum total of our existence. And you see the people that are just living as if this life were the sum total of all that there is. But death is just a doorway. Jesus' death on the cross was not the end of the story. Because three days later, there was an empty tomb where the body was once laid. They showed up and there was no body. The grave clothes had been put in order where he was laying. The stone had been rolled away and resurrection life was offered to all. This morning, we're gonna take the bread and the cup together. The bread signifying the body of Jesus, the, the cup signifying his shed blood. And it's a reminder of what he's done for us and something we do until he comes again. Would you come this morning? We'll take the elements together in just a few moments. Hold them until everyone's been served. Please come and take the bread and the cup. Christ be magnified in me. Singing, oh, Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me, oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life, Christ be magnified in me. Let his 
Christ's praise arise, Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life, Christ be magnified in me. Life Church, we serve an open communion, meaning you don't have to be a member of this church to partake of communion together. The biblical standard is that you be a follower of Christ to not take the bread and the cup in an unworthy manner. So if anybody's not been served, maybe you thought you couldn't partake, but if you would just wave your hand, our ushers will gladly help you get the elements together today. Paul wrote to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed took bread. After he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this every time you drink it in remembrance of me. For every time you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Jesus, we thank you that your body was broken that our sins could be washed clean. Lord, as the, as the prophet wrote, that though they were crimson, though they were scarlet, they were washed white as wool. Jesus, thank you for paying the price. Thank you, Jesus, for opening the door that we have access to the Father through your blood, through your broken body. Jesus, we thank you. And Lord, we not only remember what you've done for us, but we know that one day we will see you face to face. That we know that the great hope is that one day you will return. And Lord, we proclaim what you've done until you come back. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You can take the bread and the cup together this morning. And as you do, can you just give him worship in your own words? Thank him for what he's done. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for paying the price for me once and for all. Lord, no longer do we have to come with the blood of sheep and of goats, of offerings and sacrifices, Lord, but you've paid the price and opened the way, Lord. Lord, we know that in this life, we're gonna face troubles and tribulations and trials and temptations, but we don't have to fear because Jesus, you have overcome the world and you are the King. We thank you today, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Amen. 
worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship. Let's sing that again. You are here. You are here. You're moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. You're working in this place. I worship you. I worship. keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are you are here you are here touching every I worship you, I worship you, you are here, you're healing every heart, I worship you, I worship you. Never stop. 
feel kind of impressed to take a second. I know you all know, if you've ever come to church here even one time before, I'm a very feely person. My feelings are very important to me. However, <laughs> this morning I feel really impressed that this whole, our last song said, I'm not going to go by what I feel, but by the truth, right? I'm, and this one, even if I don't feel like you're doing something, God, I know that you are. And the truth of God is that he's always doing something. And he can make the worst, most challenging, most exhausting, whatever, situation. And when you turn around and look back five, ten, hopefully not ten, you know, like six hours after, you're like, oh, man, I'm so glad you did that, God, right? He turns it for good somehow. I don't know how he does it, but he's incredible that way. And I just feel so impressed for I want to remind everyone, I don't know. If you're doing your Bible study every day and you don't feel like God is doing something in you every day, you don't feel like you just saw that bright shining light on that one verse that changed everything in your life in that very moment, not that I'm speaking from experience again. He's still doing something. I, it's been, I don't know, it's been week after week after week. I don't know, for probably six months, every week has our pastor or our people have fill in for our pastor. Have they said, get into the word every day, pray every day. Has Rod been saying in pastor in corner time over there for years, get into the word. Here's how to read the Bible. Here's how to study the Bible. Here's how to pray. Have we, is this a message that we have received in this church body? If you are new here, I'm so sorry, but get ready. Don't be surprised when you hear that today because it's coming because it's so important. It's so important. And I have started with my children. We are reading a chapter a day. We are reading our Bibles every day and my house feels different. I mean, okay, I went back to the feelings, but it's because of the truth of God's word in my house. My kids still fight. It's still exhausting. You still have to parent every second of the day. I don't know how anyone ever got to be an adult. I don't know how you guys did it. So if you have adult children right now, just, I'm not praising you, but good job. It is hard work that God has given us to do, but you got to do it. You do it every day. You do it every second of every day. You keep doing it. It's the same in, with God's word. It is important to your life. It is valuable to your life. Even if you're reading the word every day and you don't have butterflies in your stomach because you're so excited about what God did in you that day, he's still working. 
He is still doing. If you are not in your word every day yet, start today. It's not a hard thing. Start with one scripture verse, but it's important. It is important. I, I feel, I, I see, I, I'm sorry. I see how feeling I am. I can't say a sentence without saying feel. But it seems like we might be coming into hard times. And the Bible says that in near the end, there's going to be a lot of deception and a lot of things that seem like they're right, but they're just not. And if we don't know our God, if we don't know his word, if we aren't very intimate with knowing him, we won't be able to see what's not him. So today, as we close out this time, I want to worship him again. I want to thank him for the truth of his word, for the fact that even though my feelings are like waves tossed about to and fro and they're up and down and Johnny doesn't ever know, do I love him? Do I hate him? What is it? Poor guy. I can still stand firm on the truth of God's word. And the truth of God's word says I love my husband. So that's what I want to live by. Even if my hormones say differently, I still love him. So thank you, God, that your truth stands firm, that your word never changes, that your word is alive. And when we are in it, you speak to us and you change us even if we don't see it. So God, today, if you want to make a new commitment to him to be in his word, to look at his word differently, to look at it as a life-giving need that you need. You need it more than breakfast. You need it more than water. You need him. You need his word. So today, I'm going to lift my hands again today and say, Jesus, I'm going to commit myself to your word again, to being in your word, to letting your word have time to speak into my life. I want to be changed by you and your word and the things you speak to me through the Bible. I want to be changed in that way, Jesus. So thank you. Thank you, Jesus, that you gave us that gift. Thank you, Jesus, that you made the ultimate sacrifice and then you made a way for us to have a thing that we could use to connect with you, that we could use to see you moving and living and breathing. You gave us a thing we could hold in our hands and see that. So God, we commit ourselves to you. We commit ourselves to being in your word. We commit ourselves to knowing you. We commit our lives to being honoring to you. When no one's looking, we want to honor you. We want to make your name great in this world. When we're on service calls where the people feel like idiots, we want to honor you in everything we say, in everything we do. So Jesus, be honored today. Speak to us. Thank you that we have an opportunity to hear from your word this morning. Thank you that you have spoken to our pastor and that he will give a word from you. We want to receive that today. So Jesus, come and have your way. Holy Spirit, come and have your way in us. Speak to us. May we leave this place different than when we came in, knowing you better, drawing closer to you, having more determination to be in a better relationship with you to know you better, to walk with you. Because even when we can't feel it, you're working. Even when we can't see your hand at work, you do it because you're just that amazing. So thank you for being amazing. Can you just lift your voice to him? Just tell him thank you today. Thank you, Jesus. I love you. I love you. I love being in your presence. I love walking with you. I love that you are everywhere that I go. Thank you for choosing me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you, Jesus, that we don't have to do anything to earn it, that you already paid it all on our behalf. So thank you for doing that. We love you today. And we are going to listen and hear for what you would speak to each of us today. In Jesus' awesome name we pray. Amen.
So glad you are here this morning. If you are a guest with us, we are so delighted that you're here. Can we just give all of our guests a first time welcome? Can we do that? So glad you're here today. If you're with us for the first time, uh, we just are excited to have you, and uh, we just pray that the Lord's presence just permeates this place, and you're, you feel that, and you sense that. And so this morning, if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to Luke chapter 18, and we're going to actually begin a series today on the parables of Jesus. And today's message is one of those messages that I just got to be real honest, it kind of makes people feel uncomfortable. In fact, there's really something about parables, just a little history on them and some facts about them, how to understand them, how to dissect them. Know that the word parable appears in the Synoptic Gospels, which is everything but John, um, 48 times. I mean, in those 48 times, 17 times in Matthew, 13 times in Mark, 18 times in Luke, I mean, because John is not a synoptic gospel, obviously no need to say zero times in John, it literally, parable literally means the idea of to place alongside. I mean, it's, it's two Greek words come together, uh, para and bale, and it's the idea uh, alongside you're throwing something. And so, so literally it means to place something alongside of something else. So, I mean, so w- which suggests, if you will, if you look at this and you study it, it's, it suggests a comparison. It suggests, in, or probably in more cases than not, it suggests a contrast. I mean, th- there is a, a contrast between two things that are very, very similar to each other, but oftentimes the, the deal is, is they are very antithetical. I mean, they're, they're likened to each other, but they are totally different. So kind of like when we talk about, how many of you have ever heard of Adam and Jesus are very similar? How many of you have heard that before in the scriptures? We, we see that. I mean, kind of like when you think about Adam and Jesus, right? I mean, so when we start to understand that Jesus is like Adam, but he is also radically different because Jesus is without sin and Adam was with sin. I mean, so we start to understand those roles. And so uh, Jesus' parables, they were ingenious. Just want you to know this. I mean, when you think of stories and perfect illustrations, I mean, Jesus was brilliant. He, he used word pictures uh, and he used them for spiritual lessons to show people what's up. And it's important to know that in these parables, all parables have a gospel illustration. I mean, in fact, parables are oftentimes some sort of, some form of, of judgment uh, against a hard-hearted individual or a hard-hearted unbelief. Uh, and in most cases, parables express one dominant theme uh, not always in all cases, but usually in most cases, there's only one theme. It's also interesting, I'm just kind of giving you all this information beforehand before we jump into Matthew 13 in a second, but uh, it's, it's also interesting to know uh, in these word pictures, or I guess you could call them elongated similes, th- there's always some sort of extended metaphor. But Jesus is speaking these parables, and and he tells us why, in Matthew 13, he tells us why he uses parables, and I I want you to see it here on the screen. You can see it. Then the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, he says, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. Verse 12, for to the one who has, more will be given. And he will have an abundance from the one who, who has not, even though, even though even what he has will be taken away. Verse 13, this is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. You see, the, the parable, the idea of the parable, it is written basically mainly to the believer. I mean, it's the believer's heart that is able to take and discern what is being said. I mean, if you live your entire life void of the Holy Spirit, I mean, then spiritual things are going to be of utter and complete foolishness to you. 
I mean, the truth is, I mean, maybe you're here this morning and you're like, man, some of the stuff that Jesus says in the Bible is just so dumb. I mean, I mean, I don't even understand. I mean, like anybody could really ever get the stuff he says. And the truth is, is I mean, unless the Holy Spirit reveals truth to a person, they're never going to understand what it is that God is saying. So, but if, if the Holy Spirit, let me just tell you something, if the Holy Spirit is in you, that's a different story all along together, right? I mean, if the Holy Spirit is in you, I mean, th- then you're going to be able to reconcile the contrast that's being presented. And so, that being said, what we begin to ha- when we begin to count, uh, evaluate the whole counsel of God's Word, here's the deal, we encounter Jesus, How many of you, that's your goal this morning is you showing up to church. It's not just to see friends and family and people and and your pastor and all that. Listen, it's about experiencing Jesus, the presence of Jesus in this place, is it not? So, I mean, that's what, why, that's just what the parables are. We're hoping that as we go through the parables during this series, you're going to encounter Jesus Christ, that you will see him in a brand new way, that you will come to, to see him as not... Not just uh, uh, Jesus, the one who was meek and mild, but you will see him as the master illustrator. Now, just so you understand, interestingly enough, only Jesus spoke in parables. I mean, in fact, none of the other disciples communicated God's word in parables, and, and so this is unique to Jesus himself, and it's Jesus that we desire to encounter here, obviously, but today, as, you're, as you've opened up your Bibles to Luke 18, I know you turned from there back to Matthew 10 for a second, but Matthew 10 was just to kind of show you why Jesus uses parables. Uh, Luke 18 is actually where we're going to look at the actual parable that we're looking at this morning, looking at the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. You can turn there, Luke 18. We're going to be looking at verses 9 through 14. As you do that, can we just bow our heads in prayer for just a moment? Lord, God, we thank you, God, that we are able to join here together, this congregation. We're able to just worship you in spirit and truth. And God, we pray today that somehow by your power, that you would fill us with your grace and that you would fill us with your mercy, that we would be humbled and become humble servants of you. Lord, that we would glorify you in all we say and all we do, that we would not only be hearers of your word, but we would also be doers as well. In Christ's name, we pray. That's the whole reason we're here, is to gain from you, to experience you. In Jesus' awesome, precious, mighty name, and everybody said, Amen. amen. Like I said a while ago, this message might create some discomfort for you. I mean, as I know it has for me, and reason being, listen, it's very confronting what we're going to look at. I mean, obviously, as you'll see, it's extremely relevant to today, especially with all that's going on in our country and in our world. A great subtitle might be authentic faith. Authentic faith. I mean, when it, when it comes to this parable, because, listen, that is what is being contrasted when you, you see Jesus' words here. We're looking at authentic faith versus inauthentic faith. And as you'll see, I mean, the sufficiency of God's word is always a challenge. And I say that, and you may say, well, what do you mean by that? Because we, as we hear God's word, oftentimes we're not doers of the word at times. How many of you have heard a Bible passage, and then actually you found yourself breaking that Bible passage during the week? Anybody ever done that? Okay, I'm just saying, oftentimes we look at a scripture, and we're like, yeah, I just want to be like Jesus in church, right? And then all of a sudden, we go, and we have to deal with Apple developers. And TR says, he's nice, but let me just tell you something. On the inside, I was like ready to scream. I'm just saying. So, I mean, we hear God's word. We know God's word, and we have verses like, I mean, you think about John 3, 16, and that's a real basic scripture there. Everybody can hear, can kind of just grab a hold of, for God so loved the world that he gave his only one and begotten son, that whosoever believe in him will not perish, but have what? I mean, and so if I ask you, do you believe? In fact, do you believe that? Most people in this room would say, yes, I do. But oftentimes, listen, we are challenged with, uh, do, we, do we really truly believe that? We say yes. So we'll, 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 we'll believe that, but man, sometimes when the person cuts in front of us in traf- traffic, we really kind of hope something else happens to them, that we really hope they go somewhere else besides heaven. You know what I mean? So I, I think that most of us in the room, we hear a, a passage of Scripture like, you know, for me to live is Christ, but to die is what? 
It's great gain, right? We all can quote it. But then some of the same Christians through COVID, we had this horrible fear of dying. Oh, no. And I'm, I'm not trying to say that to be mean. I mean, some people really did have trouble with it. And, and you look at it, and I mean, it's like, wow. Uh, in fact, if we took a poll and we asked how many people want to go to heaven, every room, every, probably every person, in this hand, every person in this room would raise their hand. How many of you want to go to heaven? Okay, I mean, most of us in the room want to go to heaven. Uh, but, but when you are... I mean, I'm just going to say this. When, when you ask, well, you know, how many of you want to die? We want to go to heaven, but we don't want to die doing it, right? <laughs> so I'm just saying, I mean, if I follow it up with, you know, that, then we have these different answers, right? So come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. How many of you recognize that scripture? And I'll give you rest. How many of you feel that rest when you're in the middle of something that makes you angry? How many of you feel that when you're in the, some, in the middle of something that you have, you're anxious about? I mean, so sometimes we don't always follow. I mean, we, we know that God's word says, well, you know, that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, but sometimes we act in extremely self-righteous manners. I mean, showing and acting as a people who do not, in fact, trust the very word of God. Acting at times, I mean, literally puffed up. And I'm just telling you right now, inside, I might have been saying, oh, this is a great day, Apple developer person. But I was really inside saying, you know what, if you don't give me the stupid app, I'm going to kill you. You know what I mean? That's what I really felt like. So... I'm just saying, sometimes we get argumentative. Let me just tell you, can I tell you something? Arguments lead to quarrels, and quarrels leads to all kinds of wars within you. Does it not say that in James? So, I mean, let's look at Luke. This word picture that Jesus paints, he's going to give us a contrast. Notice this contrast. He also said in verse 9, he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. And treated other people with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed this. God, I thank you that I am not like other men. I'm just absolutely, unbelievably amazing. I'm just going to tell you right here. I mean, I'm just so glad I'm not like some of these other people, these extortioners, these unjust adulterers, or even this person standing next to me like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself or himself will be humbled. But the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Do you see the contrast? The Pharisee and the tax collector. I mean, as we go through this message, I hope you notice their social status because it's something that we're really wanting to point out here. I mean, because we're going to pay attention to that. We're also going to pay attention to their attitude, both of their attitudes, especially as it pertains to prayer. We'll even talk a little bit about uh, the, the content of their prayer. I mean, but ultimately what we're going to look at, what we're going to talk about is the final standing they actually have before God. You see, because when, when, when you look at the character attributes of the Pharisee as compared to the tax collector, it's easy or maybe even reasonable to deduce that the Pharisee is approaching things from a very self-righteous position. I mean, he, in fact, is extremely uh, on one end of things with the fault finding. He's, He's listing all the things that he is not. I mean, and he's thankful that he's not like those other people. He's not not that. And so he he takes the time to point at the tax collector next to him. His his self-righteousness puts an attitude on him that he's 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 just he's he's just better than other people. I mean, whereas, listen, look at this, the tax collector, he enters into the same room, he enters the same building, the same temple, enters in the same place with an agreement with God, and he's a fault-owning sinner. He takes responsibility, knowing that he's unworthy to actually be in such a place. And his appeal 
to God is very much a, a poverty in spirit, if you will. He's, he's poor in spirit. If you remember the Sermon on the Mount back, back in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And, and it's his kind that is going to actually inherit the kingdom of God, Jesus said. So, now what we're defining here are social constructs. And, and, and it's an idea that has been created and accepted by, uh, social constructs are an idea that have been, has been created and accepted by people in a society in a particular time, in a particular era, and, and we have plenty of social constructs within our own era today, and many people protest these, these social constructs, and they're, 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 they're usually a, a class distinction of a particular construct. I mean, so in the social construct, in the biblical time that we are looking at in Luke chapter 18, Israel actually has no central government. They have none whatsoever. I mean, they, 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 they submitted to the Roman Empire. And so family in Israel was their, was their typical hierarchy. I mean, social position was based upon your religious tradition. And Jesus talks about the rich and the poor. Mainly, I'm just going to tell you this, because mainly he talks about the rich and the poor. Everybody's like, well, where's the middle class in that whole system? There were very few who were neither rich or poor. And so landowners, as they would call them, uh, they were the wealthiest. Uh, Military or Roman government officials, uh, which also included the priests and the Pharisees, were considered the upper class. They were very rich. They had money. They had it together, it seemingly so. So uh, marketplace workers, artisans, etc., were really the middle class, which was a very small, minor amount of people. It was a very small group. And, but probably the largest group, the lower class, were the laborers or the field workers. But even below the laborer or the field worker was what we would call the socially distanced tax collector. I mean, the, the tax collector was, was seen as even less than the lower class. I mean, he, he was seen as a traitor. He was seen as a person who was betraying his kinsmen, and on behalf of the Roman Empire, he took advantage and, and, and took taxes in a way that was unbecoming to their community, and so, which really meant he was against their family. He was against their families. I mean, family was hierarchical. Uh, the, the family was the hierarchical system of the day in Israel, and so we start to understand the fallen nature of humanity when we start looking at this. It's the same fallen nature that's in our humanity today. I mean, we start to understand this thing called ontological equality. It's your nickel word for the day. What that means is, is the idea we are, that we are all created equally in the eyes of God. We are all created equal with God equally. God created us equally, male and female. He created us. And certainly we have different roles nonetheless. But listen, we all reflect the image of the creator of the universe. And each of us do so equally. But but social constructs are the very things that oftentimes brings these equalities, if you will, to new levels. And so, in fact, let me just, I want you to just write this down. You can see these uh, notes here that you're, you can take them on your app if you have them, if you can even download them. If you're new and you have an Apple phone, you're going to be like in trouble if you've never downloaded that before because of a, I'm not even going to say his name, but he's an Apple developer and it makes me so mad. Anyway, let's just write this in, okay? I'm just, I'm going to preach to myself in a second. So, okay. Number one, can I just tell you something? Social status, when it comes to Jesus, does nothing for us. When it comes to Jesus, your social status, I mean, it doesn't matter, rich, poor, slave, free, Greek, Hebrew, it doesn't matter. What I mean by that is this, there's no advantage, there's no advantage in the eyes of the Lord. In fact, we see in James chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, where he says this, If you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Psh, that doesn't sound like the Pharisee, his prayer, Pastor Tony. I mean, I don't know why in the world you are sitting here talking about that guy. I mean, what in the world? I mean, I mean, he's over here saying, Lord, thank you that I'm not like this guy over here that really stinks. I mean, I'm, 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 thank you I'm not like this, this low scum of the earth sucker over here. But listen, you are doing well if, in fact, you love your neighbor. But notice verse 9 in James 2. But if you show partiality, 
How many of you love this scripture because it's here, whether you like it or not? If you show partiality, you are committing sin. Can't get much clearer than that, can you? You're, you sh- if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. And we all know Galatians 3, I mean, neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free nor male nor free nor we, We've got that. But, but some of our social constructs today, we can really laugh at, really, to a certain extent. I mean, we have people in our society, and maybe they are the CEO or the boss. How many of you have someone that you work for? If they're in the room, you can just kind of pretend like you didn't hear anything I just said. But if you have a boss that expects you to keep up with certain things that they don't even keep up with. Anybody have that? Okay. Put your hands down my staff. I'm just telling you right now, you better, I'm just kidding. So how many of you have a boss that they expect certain things out of you, but then, okay. How many, how many of you know how that feels? Doesn't feel real great, does it? They, they expect you to keep company rules, but you don't keep them, right? How many of you are the boss and you can like just say, say it like it is and you expect everybody to do what you say? Raise your hand. Okay, good. Okay, so uh, listen, I'm saying this. Some of the, some of the, entitlement that happens these days, I mean, with workers, I won't go into that, but maybe you've had that boss that breaks all the company rules and expects you to keep them. I mean, or maybe you're like, how many of you have ever, anybody flown this summer? Um, My family flew for the first time in a long time, and I got really tickled. I forget all the elite, elite status travelers they make me laugh. I mean, uh, you know, maybe you're an elite status traveler. It's hilarious as Terry and the, and the boys and I were down in Florida this year. Uh, there's some pretty elite status flyers on their way to Florida or out of Florida. And, and those points they collect, uh, their frequent flyer miles uh, give them rights. How many of you know that you have rights if you have frequent flyer miles? And in those points that, they, that give them rights, uh, listen, there are other people who are sitting in an airport and they are sitting on the floor because their flight was canceled. How many of you know that's a normal thing nowadays? Flights get canceled all the time. Uh, and, and so they have to sleep on the floor in the airport, but not the elite status flyer. Let me just tell you. The elite status flyer, they walk right past all the floor sleepers up to the counter and have a room ready and available. Yes, uh, Mr. So-and-so, uh, those guys love those status points because those points come with all the upgrades, right? I mean, they're, they're first, fly, uh, first class flying. I mean, uh, they, they're in nicer sections of the aircraft, which is not really saying all that much these days on certain flights. But anyway, while all the peasants are in the back, you know what I mean, fighting over the morsels, they're up there with a dinner plate. You know what I'm saying? Like, they got a meal, and they don't even need the meal. You know what I'm saying? They're, most of them aren't even hungry, but they'll go ahead and eat it anyway, right? That's status, right? Well, take social media. Some of the youngers in the room, among some of those students in the room, there is this thing called social media verified accounts. I mean, that's a big thing. If you see them, their name has a little check mark on the side on their social media account, signaling to everybody else, oh, wow, hey, they are important, you know. And, and not only that, but they've been verified that they are who they are. You know what I'm saying? So highly coveted item for a lot of the younger generation. But the one that is probably intertwined in this Pharisee and tax collector is another factor. And I'm just going to use it this word because here's the deal. We live in Kansas. I understand this. And if I used another word, some of you would be like, what? I'm I'm out of here. Understand what I'm saying. I'm going to use this word, advantages. Okay? I started to use the word privilege. But some of us, when we hear the word privilege, depending on how it's defined, determines whether or not we're going to listen. So I've seen different people gain advantage, gain privilege for different reasons. Growing up, my dad was in the ministry. He put a good word in for me, and I was able to go literally into a position because he had a friend that was in another position. Anybody ever gained privilege or gained access as a result of somebody else helping you out? That was very helpful. I mean, so, you know, uh, uh, I I grew up um, moving a lot. I remember at one point in time, uh, we moved uh, to all these little small, suburb- uh, not suburban, but all these small country schools. And then all of a sudden, my mom and dad moved to the bigger city. And I'll never forget there, uh, getting to this school, and I'm thinking, oh my word, I went to look to see this school. Uh, by the way, I was the only white person in the gym. 
And I mean, literally, I did not fit in whatsoever. Um, I stuck out um, like, well, I don't even know what, I, I can't even come up with the saying right now. But anyway, I stuck out big time. I, blonde hair, um, hazel eyes. And I walk in, and, and people are calling me, look at that boy, he's got big hair, because I had my hair down a little bit like this back then. I actually had hair. But um, anyway, the only way I was able to fit in with anybody in sports was to prove myself. And so I remember at one point, I mean, uh, I, how I got the attention of many of them was, was I would beat them. I was faster than they were. I was uh, better at sports than they were. I would make them pay. I liked to look like I couldn't play because I had glasses. You got to remember, a white boy with glasses, and you go into inner city, and you're a point guard. You're going to sit there, and they're going to be like, oh, this is lunch. This is lunch. I'm going to take this person out. And I would take him to the hole and, you know, lay up on them and look at them and then talk trash to them coming down and then be like this, you know, and looking straight at them. And they do, they're like, that's, that's a bad white boy. You know what I mean? And I'd be like, yeah, don't forget that. And then I would run after the, the practice was over because I didn't want to get beat up. But anyway, there was certain privilege as a result of skill. I'm just saying this. I mean, same thing with other relationships over time, whether it be somebody helped you out. I mean, you know, listen, Sometimes just not being a jerk to people can be an advantage, right? Some of you are like, what do you mean by that? Um, I, I, can I just say something? I, am I saying that you should just automatically trust whoever and you don't know them? I'm not saying that at all. If you do that, you're a fool, okay? I'm just saying, I, I don't necessarily trust an out-of-towner just because they come through town. And I, does, does it mean we're going to be a jerk to them? No, I'm not going to be a jerk to them. But I'm not going to sit there and believe everything they say either until they prove otherwise. How many of you know that's, that's important? So, you know, um, I mean, th there are advantages. There are privileges that come with relationship. Knowing someone. Listen, sometimes your parents can pay things and make things a little easier. I mean, whether we realize or not, the Pharisees' lives, you may say, where are you going with this? The Pharisees' lives came with some advantages as well. I mean, it was because of who they were. I mean, because of what they did that gave them advantage. And so sometimes having advantages can, can make you and me stand before people in a little bit more manner. In fact, I remember before I beat people in the game of basketball, I would be sitting there looking like a shaking white boy. You know what I mean? But afterwards, I'd be like walking around like this. What now? You know what I mean? Like, you know, you know what I'm saying? How many of you know what I'm talking about? Some of you are like, did you really do that? Ask my wife. She will tell you. So, um, Luke 18, uh, look at verse 9. It says this. He's, he, Jesus, also told this parable to some, who look at this, who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. See the problem? They treated others with, what's the word there? Jesus is taking, he's talking about this self-righteous contempt or despise. In the Greek, it's, it's only used one other time in the Gospels, Luke chapter 23, if you're interested. But it's referencing how Herod hated and mocked Jesus. Contempt, dis despise, I mean, implying the lowest kind of disrespect you can possibly muster up. So, I mean, so consider how you would describe someone if you're angry at them and you want to show them what's up. You want to make yourself feel better by saying something about them. What words, what phrases would you use in our culture? Well, pastor, we can't really say those words. You're right. I'm not, I'm not looking to say all the words. But we would use words like the scum of the earth. The lowest life form, right? We, that's, that's, a, that's what this word contempt means. We read it and we kind of, it's kind of like sanitized, like, you know what I mean? It seems like kind of generic and, no, it's a, it's a real serious word. It's open scorn. It's the idea of ridicule. It's the idea of mockery. It's the idea of hating this person openly. Today we might see self-righteous people, but we don't necessarily have a hierarchy like that, although in some cases, rare cases, maybe we do. But the contemporary forms of, of self-righteousness are probably... More like this. I want you to see this. Job righteousness. And I'm not talking about how hard you work. 
I'm talking about when you realize that you're a hard worker and therefore you're entitled to something more. Family righteousness. Because I, I do things right as a parent, Pastor Tony. I mean, I'm, I'm more godly than those parents who can't control their kids. They need to get their acts together. Intellectual righteousness. I'm better read. I'm more culturally uh, articulate. I'm more culturally savvy than other people because of what I read, which obviously makes me superior. I mean, I understand what I'm talking about because I've read it. I mean, theological righteousness. I have good theology, and God prefers me over people who have bad theology. Schedule righteousness. I'm self-disciplined, and I'm rigorous, and, and, and I'm really good with time management, which makes me more mature than other people. Flexibility righteousness. In a world that hates busy, I'm your guy. I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm that guy. I mean, I'm relaxed, and I'm always making time for other people. I mean, and shame on those people who don't do that. Mercy righteousness. I care about the poor and the disadvantages, or the disadvantage the way that everybody else should. I mean, I do. C- congratulations, bro, you're amazing. Legalistic righteousness. I don't drink, I don't chew, I don't smoke, I don't go with girls who do. You know what I mean? Too many Christians aren't concerned about holiness these days, Pastor Tony. That's the problem. Legalistic righteousness. Financial righteousness. I manage money and I stay out of debt. I'm not like those materialistic Christians who can't control their spending. I can't, I I mean, I, I don't go to Walmart all the time and just run around and just find ways I can spend my money. I don't do that. Tolerance. Righteousness. I'm open minded. I'm charitable. I, the, you know, but those who don't necessarily agree with me, yeah, I, I just kind of, I can just take in what they say and I can make them feel comfortable. In fact, I'm a whole lot like Jesus in that way, you know. I mean, probably a more popular one today political righteousness. Well, if you really love God, you're going to vote for who I said to vote for. Listen, which brings us, does that mean, by the way, does that mean that you should vote for the right candidate that supports biblical values? Yes, you should. But understand, what we're talking about here is we're talking about righteousness that sometimes gets dressed up in garbage that church people like to use. I thought we were going to preach about the people out there. No, we're preaching about the people inside here. That's why it's uncomfortable. It's getting quiet. (laughs) Second thought. Our prayer attitude, when you look at this story, our prayer attitude matters. I mean, look at verse 11 and 12. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed this. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust adulterers, or even like this tax collector, or that Democrat, or that Republican, or that prostitute, or that person that looks like they have a whole lot more problems than me. I just, I'm just so thankful. I'm just so blessed, Pastor Tom. I'm just so, but thank you for not making me like that, God. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, man, I'm just so grateful that I am not like any of those people. And after all, I mean, verse 12, I mean, I fast twice a week. You know, I give all the tithes that I get. And you see, sometimes our physical posture indicates our heart. You may say, well, what do you mean? I remember even when Jaden and Aiden were small, and when Terry or I would say, you know, hey, no, don't, don't touch that, you know, because it's, it's hot, you know, don't do that. How many of you ever had one of your children look at you and just be like, I thought about finding a picture, but then I thought, eh, they're getting to the point where they don't like it when I do that. But I did it anyway. I'm kidding. No, I didn't. <laughs> they're all like, whoa, wait, wait. Um, I will do it too. You guys know me, right? So anyway, but how many of you recognize that, that look in your own kid's face? You know, it's like, are you kidding me? Like I should be able to do whatever I want, right? Uh, Listen, can I tell you something? Nobody had to teach them that. They didn't have to see their mom doing it. I mean, you know, I mean, I never did that. I mean, she would be the only one that would do that, right? I mean, the, the Sermon on the Mount points to this attitude of the Pharisee. And I want you to see it because when you pray, you must not be like, Jesus says, the hypocrites. For they look at this, and this is very interesting because it's, 
it is in the scriptures, and you need to understand it. It's not just, we, we don't see things written in there uh, that are, when we read it, we're like, oh, hey, oh, they're standing and praying. Well, here, listen, is it, we, we, when you come up to prayer meeting on Wednesday night, uh, all I'll have you assume the prayer posture. I mean, some of you need to stand and walk around and pray. Listen, this thing is very cultural that they're dealing with, but the culture mattered. Understand that. When, when you see this uh, identification of Jesus, having them standing and praying in the synagogues, on the street corners, that they might be seen by other people, he says, truly I say to you, they have received their award, reward. I mean, the idea here is that they're standing and praying. In other words, they deserve to stand, which, by the way, brings up the third point. Our prayer posture matters. The, 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 the Pharisee, by his very posture, standing erect in that culture, says it all. Praying, listen, let me just tell you something was all about God. And I think when, we, when, when, when you prayed culturally, most times we see passages that refer to someone falling on their face before God. How many of you ever read passages like that? I mean, the idea of, uh, of, of falling prostrate before God, and, but not a Pharisee, though, because, listen, a Pharisee, he earned his way to be able to stand. He had done enough Bible training. He had done enough uh, Torah training. And it's obvious from our text, Luke chapter 18, that this Pharisee, instead of concerning himself with the attributes of God, how great our God. Can I just tell you something? When you came in to, to worship this morning and we were singing songs, I mean, let me just tell you about how great our God is. Let me just tell you about how amazing his attributes are. His goodness, his, his faithfulness, um, everything about him that re reflects his nearness, it's absolutely Absolutely, unbelievably amazing, but let me also tell you something on the other side of things. It's also his greatness. In other words, he could squash you like a bug. He could squash every single one of us, but he chooses not to because of his goodness. So, I mean, you start looking at this, and instead of the Pharisee paying attention to all those things, all this Pharisee can do is talk about himself. You say, well, what do you mean? He uses the word I five times if you look at this. Luke 18, look at it. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed this, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust adulterers, and even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give all my tithes, all, all that I get. Listen, Jews at that time were required to fast. You want to hear how many times per year? Once. On the Day of Atonement. Every single year. You say, well, this guy... Apparently, he's super spiritual. Yeah, he's bragging about doing this twice a week, which makes him be on some sort of extra credit program, right? So, I mean, but, but you see, it's the, it's the attitude. It's the disposition of the heart that separates I mean, we realize that in the contrast of life. I mean, when we see the beauty of a person who loves Jesus Christ... When we see a person that, man, just in the simplicity of, of, of loving Jesus with all their heart and their mind and their soul and their strength, and then they love other people around them, you know, listen, it's metaphors that we see contrasted light in a dark world. I mean, but when we measure from one person to another, do you see the backdrop of the darkness of unrighteousness uh, up against the beauty of Christ, the, this contrast that we see? In the, in the humility of a, of a heart that loves God. I mean, look, look at this heart. Look at the tax collector, verse 13. I want you to see it. He says, but, and again, notice the contrast. Jesus is creating contrast, contrasting the Pharisee. But the tax collector, what is he doing? He's standing far away. In other words, he's not at the dead center. He's not closest to the holy of holies. Why? Because he knows he doesn't belong there. He knows he doesn't need to be in the center of the room. He's far off in the excesses of the, of the rooms. And so, and what did he do? He's standing far off and he would not even lift up his eyes to heaven but beat his breast saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. He, he's, he's talking to holy God with an absolute honest humility. I mean, some people in our world these days, are, are, they, they use disclaimers. They'll say things like, hey, PT, listen, you know what? I just, 
I, I don't mean to be a jerk, but I, I just, I'm just being honest. You know what I mean? How many of you know that usually means somebody's going to say something really not nice to you? How many of you know that? So sometimes that's permission to allow us to be jerks when we want to be honest, right? How many of you ever use that? How many of you just learned a new tactic you can use with your spouse? Okay, very good. So there's a difference between someone who comes to you and says, you know what, man, you're just fat, dude, you know, uh, you know or some, someone says, well, since we spend time together, you know, maybe we could just go on vigorous walks together. I mean, listen, both people said the same thing, right? Well, since we spend time together, I mean, let's just go ahead and hang out and, and, and exercise together. I mean, but listen, both people are saying the same thing, you're fat, right? But one said it with humility and kindness, right? So some of you are like, did somebody really say that to you? No, I'm just being funny. But I am losing weight, so get that. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, listen, kindness sometimes works with people. Do you not know that? How many of you ever tried kindness? Okay. <laughs> we need to preach on that next week. Anyway, so uh, just, just uh, since we're there, some people get to a certain age and they automatically assume that their age gives them the right to say anything they want. Well, let me just say, can I just tell you something? That's not necessarily true. I mean, it's that excuse. If you want to use that excuse, that sounds like a cop-out to walk in the flesh instead of walking in the spirit. I mean, you know, it's like the person who gives the excuse. Well, I'll just tell it like it is. How many of you know somebody like that? Okay. Well, I'm just saying, <laughs> wouldn't it just be better if you say, I like to be somewhat rude, and so I'm just going to say things? You know what I mean? Instead of walking in the kindness of God, I'm going to say things to you that you're not going to like at all, okay? Just so you know, tax collectors were considered to be unclean. I mean, because of their close association with Rome and, and, and the Gentiles. And if a tax collector went through your house, you would probably rather have a thief go through your house than a tax collector. Because here's the thing. The difference between the thief and the tax collector, the thief was in there just to look for what he wanted to steal, and he would just steal that and touch it and leave, right? He'd be gone. The tax collector would go through and they'd touch every single thing you had because they want to find out how much to tax you on whatever you owned, right? But, so understand this. The tax collector in Jesus' parable what does he do? He stands at the edge of the temple grounds because he knew he didn't even deserve to be there. I, even, I, I mean, even the way Jesus taught us to pray, I mean, how many of you know uh, the Lord's Prayer? I mean, our Father who art in heaven, right? Hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So listen, our Father, which is art in heaven, I mean, holy is your name, O oh God. I mean, we're, we're, we're learning the holiness of God. Your kingdom come. In other words, the idea is, is that it's not about you. It's not about what you want. It's about his kingdom and what God wants. I mean, the tax collector seems to be encountering a different God than the Pharisee. The tax collector seems to be encountering a holy God, a consuming fire, but not so much with the Pharisee. Isaiah 64, 6 says it this way, we have all become like one who is unclean and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. Listen, this tax collector, he gets it. He won't even lift his eyes toward heaven. He won't even look up. The beating of the breast was a sign of, uh, of contrition and sorrow and, and, and humility, somewhat similar to what would happen on the one day of year that the Jews did need to actually fast and pray and fast on that day of atonement. Listen, we all fade like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind take us away. David said it in Psalm 51. Oh, to be contrite. Oh, to be broken and contrite and, and have a contrite heart, oh God. Lord, you will not despise that in Psalm 51. I mean, in fact, notice that there's two polar opposites when it comes to the attitudes of the tax collector and the Pharisee. It's the idea of contrition versus attrition. You may say, well, what do you mean by that? Most of us through life, we walk through life with attrition. Well, what does that mean? It simply means this. Attrition is the idea that I'm sorry I got caught. As opposed to contrition, which means I'm shattered under the eyes of a holy God. I mean, notice the, the Pharisee's prayer is a long-winded 
33 words. Pastor, maybe you need to pay attention that you're becoming like the Pharisee. Okay, no, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to preach the word here. The tax collector, maybe you should be more like him. Maybe I should. Listen, the tax collector, he uses only seven words. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The tax collector is acknowledging his status before God as a sinner and and that he is far from being righteous. Paul understood it. I mean, you can see it in his words that he penned to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1, verse 15. It says this, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ came into the world to save who? He he came to save sinners. Why? Of whom I'm the, the foremost. Paul is saying that he's the worst sinner that he knows. The tax collector is not, not just saying, hey, I'm a sinner. He's like, I am the sinner. I am, I, it's all about my sin, and this needs to go away. The tax collector is consumed with confessing his own sin and not someone else's. And I mean, I see this in these days on social media, and I'm just telling you, people lecturing other people about everything on the, on, under the sun. How many of you know what I'm talking about? There is lectures happening from one side to the other, and I'm not just talking about politics, but Rather than simply stating their own sin, rather than pointing out everybody else's sin, maybe we should actually pay attention to ourselves a little bit more, should we not? Many times it has pride written it all, all over it. He's going back there to get him some coffee. No, I'm not. <laughs> this is pride in your life right here. Maybe I should have you do this, Steve. I'm just kidding. (laughs) Can you guys see that? It says pride. I know you can see it because I wrote it in black. (laughs) It's great. So here's the deal. This is pride in your life. And here's the deal. When things come along that happen, listen, let me just tell you something. The pride that happens in your life when things happen... It's like you try to rely on yourself and, right? So some of you are like, he just blew COVID all over that lady on the front row. (laughs) Yeah, that didn't go right. Anyway, um, here's what it's like when it's the other thing, like the tax collector. Can you guys see that? That says mercy, even though I wiped it all off because it wasn't a, 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 a marker that sticks So on the balloon. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. I could have done this to the other one too, but then I would have had to pop it, and it probably would have scared somebody, and then people write emails, and I'm sorry. I'm not, I don't have any tolerance for that. But listen, mercy, right? Mercy. The mercy of God, when things go wrong, I mean, I hope that doesn't pop. That would be terrible. (laughs) Terrible advantage or terrible illustration. So God has called you and me to be moons. You say moon. Can Can I tell you something? You as an entity don't have the ability to produce light. God is described as light over and over in Scripture. In Him, there is no darkness. He's light. He's, 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 he's got the power to create that light. I mean, not just in the beginning. Listen, do you realize everything that He said in the beginning has sustained? That it's continued to, to rise morning, noon, and night. I mean, you start looking at all the days we have and the, the way it's all calculated, and it's absolutely unbelievable. Listen, God has not called you to be the Son. There is only one Son, and His name is Jesus Christ. He's called you and I to be moons, to reflect the Son. And you and I, listen, we don't produce light on our own. The light that God produces, it cannot be reproduced. It can only be reflected. 
And it is humility that distinguishes the eternal standing between the Pharisee and the tax collector, which leads to our fourth point. And you guys can begin to make your way back, Sarah. Our standing before God, it matters. Look at it in verse 14. He says, as I tell you, this man, this tax collector, he went down to his house justified. Notice the contrast. Not not what things look like, but what Jesus declared it to be. By the way, that's kingdom mindset, by the way. I mean, and listen, we are, our lives, can I tell you something? Our lives are a vapor. We're just visiting earth. That should be how we look at things, and that's where our focus should be in this world, but not necessarily of this world. In fact, if we become a, can I just tell you something? If we become a communist country next week, listen, it, it might change how we do church, but let me also tell you, it won't change what God told us to do in his word. God has, has spoken things and has made it clear. Make disciples, preach the gospel, help build his church, Acts 2, 42 through 47 with fellowship and all that. And you and I, we must differ differentiate ourselves in humility. Humility. I mean, you talk about your status upgrade with this tax collector. The tax collector, notice, is justified. It was the lowly tax collector, not the esteemed Pharisee who is justified, who's declared not guilty. And notice, listen, the tax collector, he did this apart from religious rituals. He did this absent from self-atonement at Yom Kippur. He, he, he did it without performing any deed or any work of merit. I mean, he humbled himself before a holy God and said, you know what, I'm a sinner and God set me free. Please help me. I don't even deserve to be here. For God in Romans 3, 26, and you can see it, it says this in both the just and the just, he's both the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. How many of you are thankful for that one who is just and also is a justifier of those who do not have righteousness and which is every single person alive? God's grace to the penitent and the humble while simultaneously and silently condemning the self-righteous pride of the haughty gave the Jews one more reason to not like what Jesus' words were saying. How could God justify the ungodly? Both the tax collector and the Pharisee, they're they're both sinners. It's the contrast between his holiness and our sinfulness that will bring a person to their knees. Whether it be Psalm 8 that says, I mean, I, I know that most of us in the room have probably heard these. Psalm 8 says this, who am I that you are mindful of me? We even sing a song about that. I mean, or, or, or maybe Job, Job chapter 40, verse 4, when it says, when Job says, I am a, of small account, what shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth, I can't even say anything. Or Isaiah, when he said, woe is me, for I am a lost and a, a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a, of a people of unclean lips. And here's the contrast, for my eyes have seen the King of glory. I have seen him as he is, the Lord of hosts. You see, the the culture exalts pharisaical living. But God exalts people who are like the tax collector with the proper humble attitude people that sit there and say, you know what, I don't deserve anything. In fact, yeah, I, I deserve everything I get. If you punish me, that's, that's what I deserve. Do you believe this? Do you believe the words of Jesus? I mean, is the word of God sufficient for you this morning, dear person that's sitting in this, these pews or maybe those watching online? Or do you feel this morning that you need to express something different than what God's word expresses? Which one are you? And I want you to see this. Are you a person of attrition? Or are you a person of contrition? A person who lifts himself up will be brought low. But a tax collector like heart. When we are humble, 
and see our need for forgiveness, he fills our lives with mercy. This morning, can we pray bow our heads and bow our hearts this morning? God, we thank you this morning for this parable to us. Lord, we thank you for how merciful you've been in each of our lives. That there are so many people in this room that you've declared righteous as a result of your son Jesus. And God, we thank you for that. I am one of those, God, and I thank you for that. Lord, we just pause for a moment to thank you and to praise you and to give you glory. We honor you in this place today. With heads still bowed and eyes still closed this morning, for those of you this morning who've maybe heard this story today and and you already have a relationship with Jesus Christ. But there are times where you find yourself being more like the Pharisee than the tax collector. Whatever the self-righteousness may come packaged in, how hard you work, maybe how well your parent, how smart you are, how how smart you are or how culturally savvy you are or how good your theology is or how good you are at managing money or maybe even how disciplined you are, tolerant you are or how open-minded and charitable you are. Today, whatever the self-righteousness that you see in your own life at times, you find yourself becoming more like the Pharisee at times. And you recognize, as a Christian, you recognize that in your own life this morning and the Spirit of God is calling you out on it right now and you own it right now and you just say, that's me, that's me, God. You just slip your hand up before heaven right now. Yes. Yes. Yeah. God's speaking to hearts in this room. Yes. God sees your hands. I want to pray over you today. You can put your hands down. Lord, you have seen every single hand raised in this room today. Raised in response to the parable you told in your word. And you see the hand raised as your truth has been revealed, O God, and spotlighted the depths of our innermost being. Lord, today we just, we ask that you would help us put off any self-righteousness that raises its ugly head in our lives. Everything, Lord, that we have, it comes from you. Any righteousness that we we have comes from you and you alone. Our righteousness, your word says, is like filthy rags. We recognize our depravity. We recognize our, at times, fault-finding attitude. Lord, give us eyes to see. Lord, that we don't possess glory, but that you are only able to reflect your glory in our lives. Help us to walk in that humility, O God recognizing that you are you you and you alone are greatness not us lord when we see others who may be struggling more than us god may we not have the attitude of the pharisee rather lord give us perspective that in lord unless the lord builds the house the laborer labors in vain then unless you give us righteousness lord we can't possibly possess it on our own unless it had not been for the grace of God in our lives that you had on us when we gave our hearts and our lives to you, God, that we would be in the worst shape possible. God, bring us revelation of our depravity without you. And we ask that you would do that on every single person that's contrite in spirit this morning. In Jesus' awesome name. Heads bowed and eyes still closed. Now for those of you who may not know the Lord, Maybe you're watching online. Maybe you're right here in this room. I don't know. But what I do know is that maybe you're here today and you hear these story or this story that Jesus tells. And whether you find yourself being more like the Pharisee in, in that maybe you don't think you've done anything wrong. Or maybe you're here and you identify m- more with the tax collector. And you were afraid that when you walked into the building day today, it might have, it might cave in today. <laughs> because I don't even deserve to be here. You don't deserve to be in God's presence. Irregardless of the fact, God wants you to recognize your depravity and he also wants you to recognize his greatness. He wants you to recognize that contrast. He alone is able to save you. No one else has ever claimed this. 
Because no one else could ever conquer death. No one can conquer hell. No one can conquer the grave. He is the one with the keys to death, hell, and the grave. And he possesses the power to declare one righteous. And so this morning, if you're here and you think, you know, there's no way God could change me. You are in a perfect position to allow him to see his power and his glory at work in your life. Don't underestimate his power. He is able to change a person's life. I mean, because he overcame death and he rose again from the grave and he conquered sin. Therefore, he can help you conquer your own sin. This morning, that's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus died in your place. You did. You you did deserve death. You and I did deserve hell. But Jesus died and did all that in your place thereby making a way where there was no way. And he extends that grace to you. He extends that grace to me that when you and I repent and we ask for forgiveness, recognizing Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life, he is able to bring grace. He is able to bring mercy. He is able to bring forgiveness. And let me tell you something. It's a supernatural thing. He really does change people. Just ask around this place. I mean, especially around here. Jesus changed people's lives, and he can change your life. He did three people last week. He can do more today. But it will not happen without an attitude like the tax collector. Your sin is a stench in the nostrils of God. Yes, it is. But Jesus wants to cleanse your life and purify your life today. So will you let him in? Will you allow him to change your life? Will you allow him to be the Lord of your life today? This morning, if you're here and that's you, maybe this morning if you're watching online and that's you, I just simply want you right where you're at, maybe in that living room, you would just slip your hand up before God. Maybe you're here and you would just slip up your hand before the Lord right here in this place. No one looking around. The Lord is is, is watching today. The Lord sees your hand. The Lord sees and knows every single person, the condition of their heart in this place today. You'd say, that's me. I need Jesus Christ to be the Lord of my life today. I want to make him that today. pray that that means that every single person here has a relationship with Jesus. That's what I pray it means. It's not too late. Thank you, Jesus. I want to do something. Can you look at me? I want you to stand as well. How many of you want to have a contrite heart and spirit more than you do currently? Listen, Jesus is continually taking us from glory to glory to glory. He's continually working in our lives. And so how many of you would say, man, I really do. I, I I want God to work in my life in such a way where I recognize his power in my life instead of my own power sometimes. That's, a, that's, that's I think, a, a, a common Christian prayer. Today, I, I just want us right now, I want us to do something. I want us to slip our hands up to heaven, just right where you're at. And I just want you just to begin to ask him to help you be aware of his goodness and his greatness in your own life. Maybe you would do that and you would say, you know what, there's things in my life that you want to surrender to him this morning. I encourage you to do that as well. Lord God, we thank you, Lord, in this place for your goodness and your greatness. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy, Lord, that follows us all the days of our lives, oh God. We thank you, God, that you are actively working in our lives. We thank you that, Lord, that people that are Lord, submitted to you in this room, God, that that you long to lead us and to guide us. You long to do that for your name's sake. You long to do that for, uh, for your renown. Lord, we want to be people who make you we want, to be, we want to be people that make your renown known. 
among all the nations. We want to be people that, not just among nations, we want to be people who make your renown known around, the, around our lives, Lord. People around us, Lord, the friends that we encounter, the people that we're around, the, the, the workplace that we go to. God, we pray, God, that you would help us be, to be ever aware of your presence in our lives. Lord, that we don't deserve the status we have of salvation. Lord, but Lord, you have so freely given it to us and God, and that makes us thankful and grateful. I just want you right now, I want you just to thank him in your own way. I want you to thank him for what he's done in your life today. There's a bunch of uh, people that are in the room that are following Jesus. I want you just to thank him. I want you to be grateful to him today. Can we just thank him today? God, we are grateful, Lord, in this place. We are so grateful for what you've done for us. We don't take what you've done for us for granted, oh God. Lord, I pray that we would walk in that gratefulness today. That we would walk in that gratefulness this week. As we encounter your presence every single place we go. Where can we go from your presence? Nowhere. We can't run. We can't hide. God, we, we, we don't want to. We want to walk in your presence. Be glorified in our lives today. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. In your awesome, awesome, mighty name. And every single person in the house said, can we give Jesus just a awesome praise today before we go. God bless you. Thank you for being with us. We are so glad you've been with us. Blessings on you. May God, his presence rest on you as you go.